welcome to the very first episode of I Have a Question, a brand new talk show whereby we discuss local hot button issues as well as current affairs. Now, my name is Joel and you'll know me as the political prude whereby some of the content I did during GE 2020 went a bit viral. And since then, I've been committing myself to a lot more thoughtful and also meaningful discussions. I'm joined today by three friends of mine who hold very different opinions and aren't afraid to tell me. So let me introduce them right now. <laughs> Firstly, as a member of Singapore's biggest pop band, the Sam Willows, she has had an illustrious career having been listed on the Fox 30 under 30 list. Recognizing her platform, she has been such a strong advocate for equality, mental health, and the environment. Everybody, it's Noelle King. Next, a breakout star from The Voice Singapore and Malaysia. He has since been using his platform to create a lot of positive messages and helping people in need. Uh, he has many endeavours out there, including his own social enterprise, whereby he tackles social issues and also leads youth ministries helping the youth in need. Everybody, it's Isaac Ong. Oh. Last but not least, since being crowned as the winner of the Final One Singapore, she has performed at the National Day Parade and also released her own album. And she has also been actively participating in programs centred on young women as well as the youth, um, speaking at events organised by Mendaki, PPIS, the Ministry of Education as well as the Yellow Ribbon Fund. Everybody, it's Farisha Isha. I have a question, or as we like to fondly call it, IHEC is a show where the four of us sit down to discuss an issue that we side on beforehand. Each episode, we're also joined by an expert guest who comes in to clarify doubts and provide expert opinions. We start each episode with an opening statement that we've decided on beforehand. And we all have these little pedals that we can vote, either no or yes. After which, we will begin our discussion. And at the end of each episode, we'll get to vote once again to see if our opinions have changed. Ooh. So for today's expert guest, we have a professor, Professor Jared Goggin from Wheaton New School of Communication and Information at NTU. Now, he is a renowned scholar in communication, cultural and media studies. His research is widely influential, so please give a warm welcome to Professor. <laughs> Thanks, Isaac. Well, look, it's great. It's great to be here. We're excited for the conversation. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time here. Thanks very much. All right, so let's kickstart today's discussion. So the main statement is, social media is out of control. Now we understand that it's a pretty broad topic, so let's narrow it down a little. We're specifically going to look at how society functions on social media. So on the count of three, let's raise our pedals. One, two, three. Oh. Hey, correct, right? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay, wait, so why do you guys choose this option? I like to think eventually everything osmosizes. There's a little bit of chaos first, but we generally eventually have to reach some kind of stability. Actually, I'm the same way. I feel like in order for us to understand what being in control looks like, we should maybe see what out of control looks like also. It's kind of like when I, oh, I'll be ratchet, but then, you know, when we go to Zoom, right? And then you, <laughs> yeah, when you go clubbing, Thanks right? Thanks for telling me. <laughs> when you go clubbing, when you are like, uh, new to the to the world of clubbing, and you're like, oh, let me drink a beer, let me drink a Jaeger bomb, let me drink, you know, vodka, coke, and then you drink, 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 and then like after that, at the end of the night, you you're vomit. Not that's right. Only after I form it and I then in the future I'll be like I'll drink my Jaeger bomb only. So now we're imagining a party where everyone has never drank before, never seen alcohol, comes into a party and everyone is drinking at the same time. <laughs> kind that's, of. That's, that's kind what of. you mean by out of control. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's how I see it. Lah. So so in, in my capacity, I feel like maybe we kind of need to see where how bad things can go or like how chaotic things can be before we reel it in and like, oh okay, you know what? Like we don't want that anymore. So well, I, I feel like, um, I think with every time there's new technology or new innovation, there are going to be unexpected consequences. But I don't know whether it's too soon for me to say that, yeah, we're kind of uh, in control on track, right? But when we think about vulnerable communities, you think about children, you think about the older folks, I wonder whether we need maybe a level of greater regulation, maybe responsibility on this matter. So because of that, I actually feel that we are quite out of control when it comes to social media. If you really think about it, it's how we use social media. And I think at the root of it, we don't really know how to use social media, right? We're still trying to figure it out. And if you put like everyone who doesn't know how to use something in one place, which is social media, I, I feel like 
you know, that makes it totally out of control. Yeah. So. I feel like your explanation is like the wholesome version of mine. So you were saying regulations, right? Like, do you think that there should be really strict regulations on social media? Uh, I don't know whether strict is the word. Um, I think the best way to put it is like, you know, in the past when they kind of invented cars, right? But there were no regulations in terms of the road to how fast you can drive. But then when we begin to understand that, we then put in seat belts. But those things were considered because of uh, we wanted to scale. And so social media coming to that scalability, what kind of seat belts, what kind of airbags we need to put in place. But I think the strictness is going to be dependent on how much it inhibits people. But why I raise that up is because I, I really think um, the people that I'm deeply concerned about are the people that are below, you know, even 16, 12, 7, 8. And for a lot of these kids, they are in their room, their parents and the older generation also don't really have an understanding of that. And I feel like that to me is a, a great concern of why there might be a need for regulation, age limits and all that. So that's something to, that I'm thinking about, yeah. But also on that topic, so today I was talking to someone who works at TikTok and she was saying that TikTok does have a function where I think you can tie it in with a family member so that your parents can control that. But nothing stops the kids from just creating another account. The thing with regulations is that when it's actually implemented, whether it actually helps or not is a different thing. So I mean earlier we talked about social norms, right? When I think about cancel culture, it was something that was like you know, people wanting their voices amplified and saying that, you know, this is not right. The fact that there are so many people rallying behind this one person shows that society at a whole or like this huge number of people feel that this is not right and this shouldn't happen in our society. I've also heard that people who participate in cancel culture are sort of punching up because social media is their form of power to speak up against people who are powerful with like status, with money. My question is, how effective do you think cancel culture is in doing that, in perhaps shaping norms or influencing norms or changing norms even? Yeah, it, I, I think what you say is true, right? To say that, in, that social media has been a kind of weapon of the powerless to kind of uh, even the stakes. And you can see that across you know, social media. It's been part of the reason about activism, I think, and why people have got excited about it, to be able to speak back to power in new ways. In terms of cancel culture, I'm slightly sceptical about cancel culture, I suppose, in the sense that it does seem slightly convenient, perhaps. But maybe the issues are, how do you um, keep that openness? How do you keep that ability to speak back to power uh, versus cancelling, I suppose? I mean, maybe what is the concern, maybe, in the term cancel culture is the idea that you just shut some people out and shut them down which presumably is not the long-term aim of different social movements. So on that note, right, I actually have a question for everybody, which is like a poll as well, because obviously the, the, the conversation surrounding cancel culture online has been quite divisive. And, you know, a lot of people are for, some people, a lot of people are, are not for it as well. So my question to everyone is, and using a pedal, um, do you think that cancel culture does more good than bad in society? At the count of three, one, two, three. Interesting. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Was, I believe it does more bad, right? Yeah, yeah. Cancer yeah. culture. That's more bad. What? <laughs> so you're the first one to speak, is it? Oh, interesting. <laughs> so I don't, I, I personally don't think that cancer culture is new. Example, I live in HGB block. Last time I was younger, I would hear, oh, you know, I tell you, uh, this uncle, uh, he did this, uh, he funny business now. Then all the neighbours will cancel him, right? Nobody will talk to him, they will isolate him because I guess cancel culture is also kind of a place where we feel like, hey, the justice system cannot be served to a certain degree. And it may not say that the justice system is bad, it's just that whether it's resource or network or nobody to bring up the case, they go, we need to kind of solve this and settle this. And now we're talking about social media where it's a huge public platform. But then cancel culture, I feel like today has evolved to a place where people can project their unhappiness uh, and the goal is no longer just about trying to make sure someone realizes their mistake. But cancel culture goes down this route. We want to completely destroy a person. And I think justice at large shouldn't just be about someone serving sentence. There should be an element of restorative justice, which I feel like cancel culture doesn't have that. A lot of social norms have yet to be developed. And so at this stage, I would say that cancel culture does more bad. What it looks like long term, that's something to be discussed if we really believe that eventually it will evolve even better. Um, but that's that's why I, I, I disagree. I actually have a um, confession to make because like when I when I voted um, that it does more good and bad, actually I was a bit divided, right? Because as I think you're alluding to as well, there is different types of 
what constitutes cancel culture. Mm. While I am divided, I lean towards that it does more good because of what I perceive as like a net benefit to it. And whereby I see like on the whole, examples of cancel culture has allowed society to kind of like be more aware of certain things that are that offend people, for example, or you know, hurt certain groups of people that normally wouldn't have that opportunity to like have their voices heard. So in that sense, then I think as a whole, we are able to kind of understand things a little bit better, um, although at the expense of certain people. So that's where I feel like I'm, I'm a bit divided. When it comes to cancel culture, and again, like the different tiers of it, right? For me, I agree with call-out culture because to me, the root intention of that is really just accountability. Why I draw the line for myself is that I don't demand for consequences because I feel like that's not my place. I will call you out on something that I don't agree with you on. And just as I had the freedom to call you out, you have the freedom to defend yourself as well. And you have the freedom to explain yourself to me. Rather than call out, um, maybe try thinking about like calling in as well, which is a concept of like, rather than you know shouting about it online and whatnot, maybe approach that person first. Uh, when it comes to trying to change people's behavior, like confrontation and aggressiveness might not be the best approach. Rather, like coming from a place of compassion might work a little bit better. One of an example that I can think for myself is that like, when um, Blackpink performed at Coachella, and then I read this article by a major publication, and the first line was, I watched J-pop then, Blackpink. Oh. And I was like, oh man. And then I like looked for this person online and I, and I, and I found out that like, she was like, she's not an Asian writer, like, basically. So I had the decision, right, whether or not like, I can call this person out for being ignorant or just like DM her to just explain. And I chose to DM because I feel like at the end of the day, there's no need for me to shame, publicly shame. You know, all I want was like accurate information portrayed. So I DM'd and then like she was like, hey, thanks for, you know, checking in and thanks for like let, letting me know. And then she changed the article. And for me, like that was more than enough. Lah. For me, I think calling in when appropriate actually can do a lot more than calling out. And so on that note, I, I agree. And I think a lot of times when we want to address people, I think it's, it's, it's good for us to address first in private. We're also talking about, will people make mistakes 100%, right? Um, but we also don't want to give a, a, a pass to everybody. Just because you may make mistakes, it means you can keep making it, right? I know tons of people today that no longer really actually dare to talk about things anymore. But its current stage in place has its sterilized community and sterilized culture to the point that no one can be honest about anything anymore. I think it's really interesting to note that our OP research here states that I think 60 or 70 percent of people are afraid of speaking out because of cancel culture. But I also am quite interested to know if this is a generational thing. Because I mean, I do feel like, for example, our generation, we grew up on the internet and immediately there was so much judgment. Right? I mean, it feels like, for example, the Gen Zers, right? They're all so used to, for example, getting online hate or like knowing that there are multiple opinions on, on, online that they're not as afraid as we are anymore. Call me out, fine. Oh, cancel, whatever. Like, meh. And then I'm back again because, I mean, I think it's also important to note that nobody really gets cancelled. So, I mean, cancel culture as the phrase is coined to kind of like suppress people and maybe instead of being like oh it's bad or it's good it's like we just need to take it and be like what is this really and i do think cancel culture and the aggression and whatever is the baby form of the evolution and maybe calling in is the second pikachu version what is it called yeah. right you right 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 of cancel culture you know and maybe yeah it's time that we move into that phase and that's great that we're talking about it means that we can move in yeah i think i mean i we i know of a, a recent case in singapore that someone is of Gen Z. She said something that she didn't believe. She was learning, she messed up, and then she got severely cancelled. And I was with her the entire process, and she was weeping, and it really broke her heart because she goes, that's not who I am. You know, and I, and I absolutely agree, I feel like. But and there's so, plenty of people that can bounce back completely just 100%. from taking accountability. So, but I tell you, the support system needed to be really, really strong. And so mm -hmm. that's why I feel like it continues to do a lot worse than good, you know? I don't know whether people are really after justice and really completely feel passionate about a subject or it's just really like, ah, and then they don't follow through, which, which I feel like a lot of times people don't follow through. So we know of cases in Singapore that they have been completely cancelled and then later, charges are dropped, but the person has been sentenced in the public and nobody completely talks about it anymore. And that's it. And the person is wiped out. And that's where I feel like cancel culture, does it, is it the, a good way of just, like, is it a healthy justice system? I don't think so. And the truth of the matter, I think specifically in Singapore, because Singapore is so small, people remember you for that. 
you know, I know our post says, our post said that, oh, if I find out about, you know, this person and I found out differing news, I would actually change my opinion. Uh, and I, when I read that poll and I saw that a lot of people said, yes, we do that, uh, I genuinely sat there and I went, I wonder how much of us really uh, wishing that we are people like that and in actuality, whether we would still go, I uh, confirm some sus, you know, confirm there's something about this person. I mean, person, a lot of this boils you know? down to flaws in just human nature yeah. in general, which will yeah. also enact itself with or without social media, you know what I mean? Agree, yeah. agree. Yeah, but just with social media, it amplifies, you know, and I just look at these people and I go, it's really hard for them to live and have a normal life. Even if the people, even if the person is now going through this whole process of being cleaned up, settling their life, um, but because there is already a certain stigma and hate towards him, people won't let him off. And every now and then, his name will come up again, and it will just keep bearing him further and further and further. A lot of the times, cancel culture gets lost in the individual because people are so focused on just vilifying this individual that the idea for why it started, like the real problem, is forgotten. And I think that's the thing that we need to address, right? To bring attention to to keep bringing attention to the issue at hand and not so much the individual. Because like Mike Narell said, it's, you know, something, it's a lesson to be learned for society, for us to move forward and for us to, like you said, grow and learn, right? That's really such a great yeah. point. It's really just taking yeah. the emphasis off the individuals because individuals, uh, like everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. Everybody has those. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Eh? You okay? <laughs> okay, wait, I, I have one more point to make and well, for this point, I'm going to flip my, my pedal to red because I feel like um, it will probably be something that you, you, aligned, you are aligned with. Um, and it's the sense that like perhaps um, a danger of like the whole mob mentality and cancel culture as a whole is that it has cultivated this sense of like it's cool to call out people and it's, it's cool to, to um, like demonize people online, you know. That now this group of people who kind of feel like they have like this moral superiority to call out someone and they feel like, oh yes, because I called someone, I'm cool. And um, in one of the, the, the cases of someone being cancelled in Singapore, I personally saw it with my own two eyes that like the thing that the influencer was involved in actually didn't have that many views. But then you just needed one person who was against um, to shout about it on social media. That content went viral not because of that influencer. It went viral because of the community of people who were shouting about that content. And ironically, then everybody was like, hey, you know, like, so to it's me... It's issue of scapegoat, basically. Kind of, kind of. And it's like, as we are so focused on being like, on, on trying to make the world a better place, perhaps we you know, turn into the people that we, we criticize. But the world isn't so black and white. The world isn't heroes and villains, you know? Like, ev like everyone has flaws. And I think that we, we need to like, acknowledge that, basically. Yeah. I mean, I guess the key difference to me also between, like, for example, like, call-out versus cancel culture is vitriol, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's anger. Yeah. You know, even when we're doing, like, the, the OP poll, it's like, even some of the comments, they're so heated and they're so yeah. hurt when technically it could be something that you could take much more objectively. So, I mean, as a mental health advocate, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. this is just where I'm going to like cut in and be like, <laughs> let's take care of ourselves. So I hate the term cancel culture. Yeah. It just sounds, it, it just sounds so snarky, like, oh, I'm cancelling you and... It, it's quite like a pity that I, the, the term cancel culture has such like a sticky, you know, yeah. t like, um, what do you call that, like, sticky what? Um, sticky. That is sticky. Like, like, sticky like, like, it, it, <laughs> <ooh>. <laughs> but like, you know, I, I remember a, a, a time where like cancelling was just a funny thing on, on Twitter. If, if you like um, Christina Aguilera or Britney Spears, you're cancelled, you know, and I, I agree, like, Britney's better. Narelle. It's, <laughs> it's the X Factor over the voice. Christina totally has the X Factor. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the show. <laughs> <laughs> so you two seconds. <laughs> Even when we were discussing cancel culture on Instagram and whatnot, we already see like how there was too many, sorry, there were two very strong camps, right? Who are like one for, one against. And very seldom do we see people like kind of like in the middle. So it kind of like leads to my next point, which is also related to today's topic on whether or not like, um, it's like social media is out of control, uh, whereby we kind of always see two big camps going at each other. So can we do a poll whereby uh, I want to find out, you know, whether we think um, social media divides more than it unites. GPS says, yeah, but like, let's just go, okay? <laughs> so like, if you, if you think social media divides, then you show blue. Then if you think it unites, show red. Okay? Okay, at the count of three. Wait. Huh? I'm not ready. Okay, okay, wait. Yeah.
Okay, think, 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 think. You ready? I think so. Wait, I, I don't know. Okay. Just show lah. Never mind. She also writing. Oh, got it. Okay. No, you are making me doubt myself. Okay, gotta come to three. Okay, okay. one, two, three. First time. Yeah, First time. <laughs> love it. Cross the table. So I think that people are always divided. We are always different anyway, right? Like um, social media, I feel, gives you an opportunity to find your tribe. I think what it is is then how do we coexist, knowing that okay, you can have your opinion, I can have mine, but we live separately. That's true, lah. I agree. And actually, when I voted for the fact that it divides more than it unites, I voted in a capacity where I don't think it's something bad. Like, I feel like it's okay. You know, it's okay to be divided. And because of the way social media is, like, people can find their tribes and people then, like, unite within smaller tribes but on the whole get divided. It's a result of plurality of opinions and I think that that's perfectly okay. I feel like social media has given us the ability to understand even more differing opinions and voices. And I think because of that, we're even coming to a place where we can agree to disagree. And that to me is unity. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. Unity means that we all have different opinions but we understand there are some bigger goals at play that we can unite upon each other better. And that's why I think that social media on the overhaul unites, but it doesn't make us uniform. And I think uniformity is not the goal, but unity is. Maybe the overall problem is, is how do you uh, bring together the diversity that we've talked about? I hear people, you know, you're saying about social media platforms with the commons, right? The idea of having something in common. And I think this is part of the issue. How do you build bridges? And so one problem, I suppose, is the sense of echo chambers and filter bubbles, right? When actually it's become dysfunctional. That people can uh, go you know, through their lives and not talk to others. And I think this is part of the problem of the, perhaps the failure of the commons in different ways, right? You have to build bridges across those. But I think this kind of powerful idea that you, may, you have the connective power of social media to actually take small conversations, private conversations, and connect them up to millions and millions of people it's an interesting point that you raised because when we did our uh, sentiment crowdsourcing, like I think a majority said that you know, living in a in an echo chamber is dangerous, right? right? So people recognize that it is not good. Yeah. But then, is there a kind of like a litmus test for for people to know whether or not they're in one? Because you don't really actively like go 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 into social media and be yeah. like, am I in an echo chamber? Yeah. You don't ask yourself that question, right? So well, you probably think other people are living in yeah, an exactly, echo chamber, exactly. right? Oh, we're all very you know cosmopolitan and yeah. diverse and something. Look, I mean, I think there are, you know, different ways of looking at diversity, right? But I think it's tricky. And it is, to some extent, in the eye of the beholder, right? To what, what is that mix between something familiar and something different, right? And I think that, that is in some ways the problem of difference. And a lot of societies are structured around the fear of difference. It gets, it gets expressed in ideas about disability, right? And that is, I think, one of the big problems. It can be tricky to figure out, is that an echo chamber? I mean, I feel like in the first place, we are automatically born into an echo chamber, right? right. Class, social, race, etc. Yeah. And I mean, maybe then the answer is to get out of the echo chambers in your reality versus like social media, because then that would automatically expand yeah. your yeah, experiences, your consciousness. Right. Well, that, some of that might be the bedrock to actually just check off. And I think that's been part of the research is it's almost critique the idea of echo chambers and filter bubbles to say, actually, you know, to what extent do actually social media just reinforce those? rather than actually challenge those, allow you to kind of open up a conversation now around Now I'm those. really wondering, right, like, actually, is it really bad to live in an echo chamber? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, but then, but then the thing is, so the, I, think, I think the point that she's trying to make is that, like, because Nara was talking about realities and then social media, right? And for example, if you, if you imagine yourself just growing up within the same group of people without social media, and just living your life within that same group of people, same-minded, you know? The, the, the violence doesn't come when you're living in the echo chamber. It comes when you're trying to mesh the echo chambers together. But it's like the moment you mesh those together and that's where all the conflict happens and then you have hierarchy and you have problems and you have difference of opinion. So maybe that's why I, that's put my question of like, right. is it really bad? What if we could just all live in an echo chamber? Right. But oh. that, that, that depends on that's it. That's interesting. <laughs> totally just, opposite just of what a question. Just question no, it, yeah. That, that, that depends on the context you're in, right? And I do think that in Singapore especially, like we, we don't have that because um, of the way our society is. You know, we like, as much as we can say like, oh, we, we want to live in a bubble. Yeah, sure, some people have that for, but for, I feel like our generation and the generation below, um, it is very much so like, 
intertwined. Yeah, of course. And, and the bubbles affect each other. Correct. Yeah. So so in that capacity then I don't think that is possible. Lah. Like I feel like, you know, yeah. So one thing I was thinking about was there was this argument about how like people who are close in proximity may disagree, but then it's human nature to like be able to still coexist and live together. When you disagree on social media, you feel like there's lesser consequence. Because technically you're just, you know, a keyboard warrior, right? You won't be like seeing this person ever. If this person is in another country, you don't have to live with them. So the whole thing about there being lesser consequences on social media, I think it's a thing that we should think about and talk about. I mean, in some sense, like I think about how much does it really matter? Like for example, let's say people get cancelled online. Like if you wanted to uproot your life and leave and just like start afresh, you technically could, you could change your name. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it in theory, yes. In theory, in theory yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, I mean, yes. I think what I was going for was also just like how do we place less importance on, yeah. like, for example, image or perception right, or right. like on social media. Mm. I wonder whether, you know, the whole cancer culture and polarization, it really has forced people to go, I don't want to come online and so I'll be anonymous. And the anonymity actually brings about a bonus to go and say, things that are a bit far-fetched or to push the boundary a little bit further. And on, on top of that is this, they purposely want to create hate. And a lot of times those people are the loudest voices because the people that maybe are a little bit more, I'm okay to agree to disagree, might be afraid to share their opinion. And therefore then we create, we have a space in social media that it's really taken by the extremes and it seems like we have very divisive people, but actually maybe not. Because a lot of the people that are maybe middle ground are very fearful of like, I better not say. So I think we've gone through a lot of questions today, but I think just to wrap up, we want to go back to the first statement that we were talking about. So, do you have your pedals ready? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> the statement is, is social media out of control? One, two, three. Ooh. Still the same. Uh, why, not today? Today? why you still stay the same? <laughs> oh, it's cool. We're, we're, still like, cool. we're like testament to agree to disagree. Which no, is my, yeah. I mean, cool. after hearing everything, I'm just like, okay, la, you know, yes, it's not as out of control as I, as I think it is, as I thought it was, but like, it is still out of control, but in time to come, it won't be. So that's, that's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Then change to blue. No, that's the same opinion you have. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I still have the same opinion. I want to be optimistic about it, you know? Yeah. I feel like there's, there's really so much to be like scared of. I just don't want to be scared. Mm. Yeah. 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 And I think that what we are also taking away is that the colours don't accurately represent us all the time yeah. because there are different issues that we're kind of flipping. If you hear throughout the entire conversation, yeah. and it's okay at the end of the day that we feel differently about different things. So as you mentioned, you feel like you're optimistic about it. But yet, in my sense also, I feel absolutely optimistic about it. But I go, I think it's out of control and we need work. Maybe the problem is putting such a big topic into a yes or no. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> Really a gradient. Oh, you have to dramatize the... <laughs> so if you want to carry on the conversation, the link for the OP sentiment poll is in the description. Make sure you go check it out, vote a little bit, find out where you stand with your opinion across everybody else. Um, so make sure you hit the link. Now, before we close up this episode, I want to thank all the people who have made this episode possible. So I want to thank Opie, Life at Funan, Visual in Consideration, The Twain Have Met, Serial Co, Colors Global, as well as City Music. And I also want to thank Prof for coming down to do the show with us. Thank you for sharing okay. your opinions, your insights. Woo! Expert opinion, baby. And uh, lastly, very cool. Um, we have we are going to be launching an iHack filter for you to for you guys to ask us questions on Instagram stories. So go just go check that out on the Zerap Instagram, right here. So if you've watched until here, thank you so much for staying. If you like the episode, please like, share, subscribe. I think what we really want to do here is just open conversations. It's something that we're going to continue putting our heart into, workshopping, making it better. And I think that's just really the sentiment. So. We would appreciate any and all support that you have and thank you so much for watching. Don't cancel us. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Bye. <laughs>